So you may be wondering, is LHS 610 the right course for you? Uh, so first I'll provide a little bit of context about our department and kind of what are some of the other courses that we teach so you can get a sense for the context within which this course is being taught. Um, and then we'll get into some specific questions about what we do cover in the course and what we don't cover to help you decide if this is the right course for you. So the Department of Learning Health Sciences, where the LHS comes from, is a basic de science department in the medical school uh, that's focused on learning, which we see as a continuous process of study and change, which ultimately leads to improvement. And I think in our department, we recognize that learning can occur at different levels of scale. So we know that individuals within a health system can learn, uh, groups can learn, organizations can learn, and then health systems can learn. And LHS 610 is a core course in our health infrastructures and learning systems uh, PhD and master's program, which we refer to HILS. And so in our program, we really try to uh, capture the breadth of the different types of learning that happens and then also focus on how to take that learning and translate it into uh, better practice uh, of medical care and better health more broadly. So you can see this kind of learning cycle on the left. Um, and so the top left corner is data to knowledge. Uh, the top right corner is knowledge to practice. And the bottom part of that circle is practice to data. And this, I think, encapsulates what are the different steps that are required to start with a data set or start with a problem more broadly and actually understand it and then implement something to affect change. So within that larger curriculum, LHS 610, this course focuses kind of on the top left part, which is assembling data, working with data, understanding it, and getting to a point where you can kind of uh, at least have hypotheses of what you may need to change going forward if you're going to implement something uh, and translate that kind of knowledge into practice. There's another course taught by Vinod, LHS 712, which is a natural language processing course specific to medicine, uh, which includes a focus on uh, you know, a lot of different medical contexts, including clinical notes, where a lot of key medical information lives. And then we have a separate part of our curriculum focused on uh, knowledge representation and management, implementation science, more broadly introduction to health informatics, health infrastructures, uh, and ethics and policy within a learning health system. And so that's just kind of the broad context in which LHS 610 sits. So now kind of a more direct question, is LHS 610 the right course for you? Uh, so I think one thing I'll point to is the prerequisites. So these are advisory prerequisites. We would like for you to have had uh, a course in statistics at some point in the past. I would say that statistics uh, as a you know uh, mechanical uh, thing that you carry out from a you know like a statistical test is not a heavy part of this course at least I would say the first kind of half of the course um, but statistical thinking is going to be prevalent throughout this course so having taken a course in statistics will definitely give you uh, a critical eye uh, as you look at data. But again, many people will have had that kind of uh, real life practical experience that could serve as a substitute for that. So if you have a question about that, feel free to reach out to me. And then we would like students to have had experience in some type of programming language, which could be Python, it could be SAS, it could be Stata. It could even be Excel formulas, because I think this course is not heavy in kind of programming concepts. It's heavy in data analysis concepts, but having some programming background could definitely be helpful. Um, if you have questions about whether you feel like your background is gonna be sufficient for this course, again, feel free to reach out to me. Uh, but whether you actually take this course as opposed to other courses that are available to you, I think comes down to really three things. One is, do you see yourself doing R in the future, using R in the future, or doing you know, data analysis more broadly? Because a lot of the vocabulary that I'm gonna give you in this course is not specific to R, but I would say R is really on the you know, bleeding edge of data analysis, uh, 
at least exploratory data analysis. Uh, so I think if you see yourself using R in a potential future uh, role, then I think this is absolutely the right course for you. If you're interested in health-oriented research, I think R has some really nice uh, things available in the form of packages that are relevant to health-oriented research in particular. And if you're going to be interfacing with the health system or healthcare providers in your future job, I think the vocabulary of kind of medicine and epidemiology that we will convey to you through this course will be of relevance to you. So I think I would look at those three questions to think about whether this is the right course for you. So it's important to talk about what we won't cover in this course, uh, just from a standpoint of setting expectations. So I really view this course as a way to teach almost like a spoken or written language. So I actually won't be teaching any foundations of programming that you would need to know beyond what is needed for doing data science. So I don't approach R as a programming language for the purposes of this course. I really approach it as a set of tools, as a set of uh, data science verbs that will, uh, when manifest as code, help you get the answer that you want um, out of a, a data set. We also won't be covering a lot of theoretical considerations other than those needed to understand how to uh, apply techniques. So we'll cover a lot of concepts uh, and a lot of practical applications, but we won't cover a, a lot of theory in this course, so we won't be doing things like simulation studies to test assumptions, etc. cetera. Uh, we will cover some supervised machine learning in this course, but we will not cover uh, any unsupervised machine learning if that was an interest to you, uh, just so that you're aware. And then, although we have, you know, I think I would say approximately three weeks dedicated to supervised machine learning, we won't be covering advanced topics in supervised machine learning. We will cover enough essentials to help you get started and to be able to get you kind of started on analyses. Uh, but I don't want you to walk away from this course thinking that, you know, you've got a complete grasp of supervised machine learning because that is a topic in and of itself that uh, we could cover multiple courses on. And then finally, um, we, I don't teach any SQL in this course. Um, I don't teach Excel, Python, SAS, or Stata, although I will try to draw comparisons where relevant so that if you are coming in with a background in one of these tools, um, I will you know, kind of compare and contrast how something that we're doing is either similar or different to something that you may be more familiar with. So let's talk a little bit about why R. So I think it's hard to disentangle uh, this question from all the things associated with R as a language that don't have to do with its actual, like the way it's written or its syntax. But I, I would say if I had to break it down, I would say uh, the number one reason I think is it's free open source multi-platform. Um, the second reason is that R was built for data science. I mean, it's a language that it was originally developed by statisticians. So a lot of its native data structures that come with it are actually the kind of data structures that are very useful in doing data analysis. And so even though I don't teach you very much kind of base R in this course, which is the kind of original R without you know um, extra packages, uh, having those native data structures available really makes data analysis a lot more friendly to do in R uh, as compared to uh, other languages. Uh, one thing I will be teaching you is an ecosystem of packages known as tidyverse. What I would say that, you know, the way I often refer to this is modern R. So although base R, uh, you know, has a lot of issues with uh, readability, etc., this tidyverse ecosystem of packages, which is pretty much the way people do analysis in R these days, is a very nice expressive syntax. And what that means is very concisely and in a readable way, you can read a piece of code and understand what it's trying to do. And you'll go, I think, uh, in this course from learning how to write syntax to eventually thinking through the steps that you need to take more at a high level such that you'll be thinking almost in like data verbs by the end of this course, as opposed to thinking about what exactly you need to type uh, on the screen. So that expressive syntax really makes it friendly so that when I'm reading a student's code, I can almost predict for you what the output is gonna be 
uh, before I type a single line of code. And I think you know that's where you're going to get towards uh, later in this course. Uh, the next thing I would say is that R is made more powerful by a lot of data-oriented packages. And many of those packages have been written by the original authors of those methods. And this is especially true in statistics or bioinformatics. So for example, um, I was developing a, or I was fitting a survival model to a data set uh, a couple years ago, and I wanted to calculate a C statistic, uh, which is also sometimes known as uh, Harrell's C statistic after Frank Harrell, who's uh, a statistician. And the package I was using was actually the package that Frank Harrell himself wrote to calculate a C statistic. So just by reading the source code of that package, I could get a sense of exactly what the steps were be that were being carried out to do this calculation in a very high fidelity way. It was coming from the person who came up with the method. Uh, so I think there's a you know, certain cool element to be able to go into the source code for these packages that have been written by the folks who actually designed those methods or developed those methods. Uh, the next thing is that R is a functional programming language. Uh, if you're not a programmer, you're kind of going to look at that and say, well, what does that mean? Practically, what it means is that I can use the same data verbs across all kinds of different situations. Um, in a way that wouldn't be possible if R's default mechanism for handling things was as an object-oriented programming language. So I won't delve into that anymore because that might have, you know, if you understand kind of programming, that might make sense to you. But as you go through this course, you're going to see how with the same set of like five or six verbs, you can do all kinds of stuff that uh, w isn't usually possible with a conventional language that doesn't have a functional uh, way of programming uh, where functions are kind of the uh, controlling factor throughout the language. Uh, the next one I would say is that R has this thing called non-standard evaluation, which helps make your code readable. Um, non-standard evaluation what it means to you as someone who's programming in R is that you don't have to put a bunch of quotes in your data set whereas, or in your code, whereas if you were coding in another language, a lot of these places where you're doing things, you'd have to uh, write quotes. Uh, so basically, non-standard evaluation is what, R, what makes R work like magic. And so I'll show you examples of that, but again, it's not critical to understand uh, conceptually, but you'll notice that your R feels different from other languages, and that's one of the things that makes it feel different. And finally, and kind of, I would say almost most importantly, uh, R has a wonderful and diverse online community. So if you are on Twitter and you follow the R stats hashtag, you will just come across all kinds of uh, interesting information about analyzing data from you know, methods type things to you know, very practical, uh, tutorials and skill sets. And so I would say that more than any other kind of community I've encountered, the R programming language community has a, uh, is wonderful and, and very, very diverse uh, in terms of kind of its makeup. Um, I included a little link below in small letters that you can click on if you have access to the uh, PDF. But basically that's uh, a nice blog post that summarizes in very practical co uh, terms with code examples all some of the reasons that I just love R and why when I'm in other environments, I'm trying to recreate some of the R functionality in those environments uh, for doing interactive data analysis. So why not one of these other tools? So I would say, you know, Excel is great for editing tabular data, but uh, to get advanced functionality, you need to write, you need to have macros and um, macros are good, but they are not as easily distributable, packageable, reusable, modifiable uh, as kind of the packages that you get um, as part of uh, you know, open source packages available in R or even Python, for example. Uh, SQL is great for querying data and uh, from a database and doing descriptive statistics. Some of the early stuff we'll do in R will actually resemble SQL in many ways. So if you know SQL and you're learning tidyverse, you're going to look at some of our code and say, wow, that looks a lot like SQL uh, in some ways, 
And that's by design, that's not an accident. Uh, SAS and SATA, I think, are great for statistical analysis. They can certainly do a lot of the other exploratory data analysis that I'll be presenting in this course. But I would say that, you know, um, our syntax is just really powerful. And some of the packages that are available in R just simply, there isn't that ecosystem in SAS um, or Stata, for example. Uh, a common question I get is, you know, why not Python or Julia? Because there's a lot of press that these two languages are kind of taking over data science. And what I would say is that Python is, is great for data analysis, but at the very bleeding edge of it, a lot of what Python is trying to do through its packages is really replicate what is being done in R, particularly with respect to exploratory data analysis. So an example of this is Pandas. Pandas is a data frame package for Python that tries to replicate um, or kind of recreate a lot of the same functionalities that are available in R by default. And what's nice is that in R, those are available by default. So uh, you actually don't have to do much installation of stuff to get started with R. And your syntax is a lot more readable because of the uh, non-standard evaluation, which is part of R, not part of Python. And then Julia, I think, is kind of up and coming. There's still a lot of stuff that Julia cannot do yet. Uh, and I would say if you read Julia syntax right now, it's not quite as expressive. But I think, you know, uh, 10 years from now, this situation might change. I still think that, you know, the way of doing things in R with tidyverse is a transferable skill. And some of the most, you know, latest packages in Python and Julia for data science are more and more trying to almost replicate the exact syntax of tidyverse. Uh, so I think if you know that syntax, it'll be applicable to a variety of other languages as well. Uh, lastly, I would say in you know, health data analysis, you often need access to statistical tests, machine learning, data visualization tools. And I would say that when you kind of put those three together, R really does a better job of giving you access to really you know, uh, deeply vetted statistical packages in addition to all the other things that you want to be able to do when you're exploring data. Um, when people ask me a question of what's different between R and Python for data analysis, I often point them to this link. Uh, so if you kind of uh, click on that link, it'll show you uh, it'll show you uh, a kind of image that has a series of comparisons for you know like when the language was formed to the different communities to the different things that they're kind of good at. So I would encourage you to take a look at that. Uh, and then sometimes people ask me, what are the downsides of R? Um, as to, you know, what's kind of not good about R uh, as reasons to not learn it? And what I would say is, in R, there's several ways to do the same thing. Um, so there's the, the base way, which is using the kind of set of base packages that come with R. There is the plier way, which um, was a package written by the you know author who ultimately ended up writing the tidy a lot of the tidyverse packages um, there is this data table uh, package which is really powerful which sits alongside tidyverse although uh, in kind of the latest update is that you can actually run data table functions using tidyverse syntax so in the end i kind of feel like there are multiple ways of doing things in r but the tidyverse way is probably the most modern, expressive, and most widely used. And so I think by understanding how tidyverse works, you'll be able to do a lot more in R, and you'll be able to translate that skill to other languages pretty readily. Um, a lot of the critiques of R have to do with the fact that base R can be slow because R is an interpreted language, meaning when you type in code, R tries to uh, you know, dynamically figure out what you're trying to do. It's not compiling your code first. But tidyverse and data table are written in C++ and C, respectively. So those are much faster languages. So the main takeaway is, is that even though some of the kind of base R stuff has a reputation of being slow, um, if you are doing stuff in tidyverse, it's going to be pretty lightning quick. Um, and in many instances, as fast or faster than pandas, which is the kind of Python equivalent of tidyverse. 
Um, R requires data to be loaded into memory for most analyses. So if you have a huge data set, you know, you, in the past you would have a challenge to analyze it in R, which is different than let's say SAS, where SAS can analyze your data on disk. But I will be showing you a package called Disk Frame, which lets you take all the same skills that you learn for working on you know, regular data frames that fit in memory and basically use your same syntax on data that uh, doesn't fit in memory, but only fits on disk. And similarly, if you have a SQL server or a SQL database uh, that you wanna work with, uh, the same exact syntax that you learn in this course, the same vocabulary, the same literal code, can be used uh, to access and work with data on databases. So I think that's part of what makes R really powerful is you learn a little bit and it takes you a really long way in a lot of different contexts.